This is the White Coat Investor Podcast, where we help those who wear the white coat get a fair shake on Wall Street. We've been helping doctors and other high-income professionals stop doing dumb things with their money since 2011. This is White Coat Investor Podcast number 261, the only investment guide you'll ever need with Andrew Tobias. Have you ever considered a different way of practicing medicine? Whether you are burned out, need a change of pace, or are looking to supplement your income, locum tenens might be the solution for you. Not sure where to start? Locumstory.com is the place where you can get real, unbiased answers to your questions. They answer basic questions like what is locum tenens, more complex questions about pay ranges, taxes, various specialties, and how locum tenens can work for you. Go to locumstory.com and get the answers. Welcome back to the podcast. I missed you guys. It's a great week, wonderful spring weather here in Utah. Um, which means it might be a blizzard or it might be uh, sunny and hot. You never know out here. Spring's a weird season in the Intermountain West. Our quote of the day today comes from Randall Bell, PhD, who said, Achievers prefer the term setback. The term success and failure imply a final point of destination. And I think that is definitely the truth. All right. If nobody's told you thanks for what you do today, let me be the first. I know you're on your way into work, your way home from work. Maybe you had a bad day. Uh, Those happen sometimes in the high-income professions. Maybe you're off working out. Uh, Whatever you're doing, though, if no one said thanks today, let me be the first. All right. Um, In case you're not aware, I have a new book out. It's called The White Coat Investor's Guide to Asset Protection. I think it's a great book. If you are interested in protecting your assets from lawsuits and understanding what your risks really are, uh, this is a book you should read. It's not that long. It's a relatively short book. In fact, about half of it, close to half of it, is the most comprehensive list of state-specific asset protection laws that I know about. Asset protection law is always state-specific. So the important thing to know is what are the laws in your state and in the states where you may do business or have assets. And so I've compiled that as a significant part of the book. You don't have to read every state's asset protection laws. You only got to read about the states you care about. So, uh, you know, in reality, you probably only need to read about 60% of the book. And uh, it's about as long as uh, the White Coat Investor book, the original one. Um, But I think it's really worthwhile. If you're worried about losing everything to a lawsuit, if you just want to make sure you've uh, done the basics of asset protection, if you want to learn more about kind of advanced asset protection techniques, if you're thinking about going to see an asset protection lawyer, if you've been named in a lawsuit, whatever, whatever your purpose is to be interested in this topic, I recommend you pick up the White Coat Investor's Guide to Asset Protection. It's available on Amazon like all of the other books. All right. Uh, We have got a great guest today. You know, one of the fun things about um, having your own podcast is you get to interview whoever you want, as long as you can talk them into coming on the podcast. So uh, sometimes that allows me to go out and find people who've had a significant impact on my financial life and bring them on the podcast and just get to know them a little bit better. And that's partly what we're doing today. We're going to be bringing on Andrew Tobias, uh, who you may know as the author of The Only Investment Guide You'll Ever Need, um, which was how I was introduced to his work, was reading that book. And there's been many different editions of it. He's got a, a new edition out of that book if you're interested in picking it up after hearing from him today. Uh, but Andy Tobias, he graduated from Harvard. He was there in the 60s. So he's an older guy now, um, but uh, eventually got an MBA from Harvard. He's written for a number of magazines that you've heard of. Um, You know, these include uh, New York Magazine, Esquire, Time, Parade, Harvard Magazine, uh, New York Times Sunday Magazine. Um, He's written uh, 12 books, I believe, um, and uh, just continues to do a a lot of great stuff in the country. Um, whether it's finance related or not finance related. So I'm looking forward to getting him on the podcast and getting to know him a little bit better. Let's get him on. Andrew Tobias, uh, we're going to call you Andy today, right? Welcome to the White Coat Investor Podcast. Thank you so much, Jim. It's wonderful to have you here. Your work's affected me personally, and uh, I've just gotten done introducing you before I brought you on. But let's hear a little bit from you. We want to hear a little bit about your upbringing and maybe how it affected your views on money. Well, I had um, a great uh, success in choosing my parents. 
And <laughs> um, my, um, they gave me $4, uh, which was a lot of money back then. I'm, I'm 75 now. So I, when I was four, I got $4. 71 years ago. And I don't really remember that, but I remember getting $5 when I was five and $6 when I was six and seven dollars. And I was hooked. And then when I was 10, my uh, grandfather gave my brother and me each, I think, 10 shares of General Motors and 10 shares of General Dynamics or whatever. And I actually, it's a little embarrassing, but I started looking at the stock pages every day and nothing ever happened. I mean, it is the most boring thing. If you're going to give your kid 10 shares or something, please make it one of these ridiculous volatile stocks that's going to go to zero, but at least it'll be fun. And they'll learn that stocks, you know, not to take terrible risks, but it's the most, you know, owning 10 shares of General Dynamics or General Motors, so boring. But we did kind of learn a little bit about this. And then um, I went to, um, I spent uh, three months behind the Iron Curtain when I was 16. And I came back um, a little communist for about five minutes until I wound up running the student businesses in college and um, going to work for a company called National Student Marketing Corporation after college that stock went from six to 140 in uh, 18 months and with stock options worth uh, a fortune, at least in my terms. Uh, It turned out that the creative accounting that the company was practicing was so creative, you could really only call it fraudulent accounting. So the president went to jail. I went to business school, wrote a book about it. And here we are. <laughs> so tell us about your education. You you did undergraduate at Harvard as well as an MBA there, correct? Right. Okay. And, uh, and you've had a pretty... I majored in Slavic languages and literatures, which means that I read War and Peace in English in the trot, you know, the little clip notes thing, because I was not a good student. But uh, The real world was much more interesting to me. So every day I would ride my bike up to Harvard Student Agencies, which is the little student run business that would, you know, rented the refrigerators and sold class rings and all those things that uh, that uh, undergraduates do to make a little extra money in college. And that was so much fun. And then they let me run a thing called Let's Go, the Student Guide to Europe, uh, which at the time was just one book uh, for Europe. And then we added some other countries and other uh, continents, I guess. Um, So I was a little business guy. Uh, I was not a good student. I, uh, my brother was summa cum laude, uh, you know, and I was barely, I wasn't summa, I wasn't magna. I was barely, you know, in the top 60% or something. But I sure did sell a lot of let's go the student guides to Europe. So I've been interested in business and money um, kind of forever. So where's that taking you in your career? Tell us some of the things you've done. Well, (laughs) I expected uh, after my high-flying stint as a 21-year-old vice president of National Student Marketing Corporation, um, I figured, well, I don't know what I'm going to be, but obviously it's going to involve lots of assistants and junior vice presidents working for me and all this stuff. And business school, uh, I did get an offer from... um, Boston Consulting Group, which made me feel good. But New York Magazine had uh, put me on the cover um, when I just was starting business school because of this article or in this book I wrote about the the uh, fraud that I was involved with, even though I was innocent, but uh, the company, uh, company didn't do so well. So um, they said, when you get out of business school, come write for us. And I said, what do you, I'm not a writer. I only wrote that thing because I was, happened to be in the middle of it, you know. Um, and I said, well, you know, you seem to, whatever. So they, I had a choice between going to Boston Consulting Group or working for New York Magazine. And happily, um, I chose the latter. And I've been writing magazine articles and books. And I had some computer software called Managing Your Money before Quicken. Uh, so for a bunch of years, I had a, uh, very good fortune with that. And uh, and then um, I somebody called from the White House and said, if a president of the United States asked you to be treasurer of the Democratic Party, would you say yes? And I said, Richard, you're, what are you calling me for? You you clearly dialed the wrong number. I said, no, 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 the president, uh, whatever. Um, and so for 18 years, it was supposed to be a two-year ceremonial kind of gig, and it wound up being 18 years. Um, and it was still, I didn't get paid to do it, but uh, it wasn't full time. 
But so I had that detour. And um, now I'm 150 years old and I'm still updating this. <laughs> <in Word Guide. laughs> so you've been publishing financial books since 1971, really. I, I count at least 12 books. How many books have you actually published, not including new editions and translations? I hear you're a terrific doctor, but you also count perfectly. <laughs> I mean, you, it's you know, you, okay. that's exactly the right number. Um, um, and actually, so the first one, um, well, the very first one was this book about national student marketing, and it was sort of a financial book because it was a cautionary tale. Stock went from six to one hundred and forty, and then in about five minutes went down to went down to three eighths or something. Um, Interestingly, you could have made as much money buying it at three ace, never did go bankrupt, and letting it recover to you know ten times that as you could have made in the very beginning. So uh, there are different ways to skin a cat. But at New York Magazine, everybody thought I would. I you know, oh my God, he's been to business school and he writes about all this stuff. He's got to be so smart. And everybody from the receptionist downstairs up to the uh, you know, editor in chief of, I don't know how many people remember now, but Clay Felker invented uh, not only New York Magazine, but all regional magazines. He was a huge guy, um, very big character. Uh, Rupert Murdoch is the one who wound up buying this whole thing and wrecking his, his life. But everybody from the receptionist on up would say, So what should he do with my money? And what? And I'm thinking, why are they asking me? I mean, you know, I don't know anything. I, 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 I know Ben Franklin said neither a borrower nor a lender be, and I know you know you spend less than you than you make, and you know, brilliant insights like that. But I did my best, and it, but it also it got kind of tedious because I would say the same thing over and over again. Um, the advice would vary a little bit if, if I was talking to Clay, who had you know lived high, had a big income and lots of rich friends, that would be a little different advice than, than for the receptionist, but not that different. And I realized, you know, rather than my doing this over and over and over again, why don't I just write it down once and, and then I can give it to everybody. Um, and I already had some pretty good success by then with um, a, a book or two, <clears throat> not about specifically about money, but and I called my editor and said, hey, I got this little investment guide. It's be tiny. The, the virtue of it, especially back then, it was much smaller than it is now because the world's got more complicated. But uh, would you publish it? And they looked and they said, well, yeah, it's not for us. And I said, oh, come on. I mean, I don't need, you don't even have to give me an advance. I don't want to start with some other publisher. Give it a try. Why not? And um, I said, you know, you, my last book was on the New York Times bestseller list for you. I mean, can't you risk, uh, you know, this thing? And no. Nope. So I took it someplace else and it sold millions of copies by now. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's, the, you know, it's the luckiest thing I ever did. Um, uh, but at first, the money was what was so great, frankly. I mean, I got paid a lot of money. The paperback, I couldn't believe they were going to buy it in paperback on top of the hardcover. The thing, you know, w w was terrific. But by now, it's not, frankly, um, uh, I'm, I'm knock wood, you know, compound interest. And if you're 150 years old, by now, you, you better be doing pretty well. So I'm, I'm, I'm okay. It's fine to get the royalties, but the emails I get, uh, and the letters of people, you know, I bought your book 40 years ago and we just <laughs> retired and I give it to all my kids and graduation and all this kind of stuff. It's, it's kind of, that's the royalty that keeps paying. So it's been a lot of fun, but also embarrassing uh, because it's called the only investment guide you'll ever need. I explain in the book why it's, you know, how that title came to be. Um, but if it's the only one you'll ever, ever need, I shouldn't really have to revise it, right? <laughs> uh, but they do th they do things without my permission. By the way, they um, they invent the internet. Uh, they ha invent IRAs and Roth IRAs and stuff, and then crypto and meme stocks. So every five or six years, I find myself um, revising it, and it's really fun to do because 
much of it stays exactly the same and I'm very lazy, so I don't have to rewrite it. But then there are ways to, you know, um, new challenges. How do you write about, what do you say about crypto and about all these things? So anyway, it's been fun and it just came out again and there won't be another one for probably five or six or seven years. Uh, by the which time I'll be 156. <laughs> well, you're in a very select group of people whose writing ability uh, I don't just admire. I- I'm frankly jealous of it. That list is very short. It includes uh, basically three other people, Morgan Housel, Bill Bernstein, and Jonathan Clemens. Your writing is both useful and entertaining. It doesn't sound like you had any formal training in writing. How did you learn to write so well? Well, first of all, you're very kind. Um, and um, you're very kind. Other than in the ninth grade, a guy named Dana Niswender. And I might get a, even a little bit choked up because nobody remembers Dana Niswender, but he was the right after lunch English teacher in my high school. And everybody else, you know, after lunch is not a good time for 14 year olds. <laughs> you know, they don't pay a lot of attention uh, to somebody who had no, he was a monotonal kind of expression. But he taught us how to write. If you listen, what is a semicolon? What is, you know, ellipsis? And, and, and what, how do you, um, it wasn't the kind of writing I do now because now I break the rules all the time, but at least I know I'm breaking the rules. Um, you're right. I didn't, I kind of write the way I talk for better or worse, probably a bit worse as people are beginning to realize. Uh, <laughs> and I try the, the hand stuff. That's the punctuation or that's the, you know, I try to get the hands in there, but um, it's just, uh, I guess, again, it comes back to a good choice of parents. My dad was a, Terrific. Um, he was the original Don Draper, basically, not literally, but of Mad Men. He, was, he had his, um, and he won all sorts of awards for his copywriting. Uh, he did the, uh, he introduced Patek Philippe watches to America and Ranzoni Sono Boni means Ranzoni is so good. That's my limit of my Italian and uh, all kinds. Of, oh, actually, you know, Manischewitz wine, you, everybody listening is too young, uh, but uh, the slogan for Manischewitz was super famous back in the in the 50s and 60s of the last century. And one day, I and a billion and a half other people on the planet were watching television when one astronaut said to the other, man, oh, Manischewitz, will you look at that crater? The astronauts were, and I, I, I remember this, and I wrote about it a few years ago, and I think, did they really, am I really remembering that right? So I, they had invented the internet and Google, so I Googled astronauts Manischewitz wine, and not only did they say it once, they said it like 20 times from the moon, all free impressions, so that was my, my dad was a, was a very good writer, and I maybe I picked up a little from him. Thank you for the compliment, and letting me tell you about my dad. So the, uh, you know, the, the bestseller here, the most popular one, it sounds like is pretty clearly the only investment guide you'll ever need, which I read yeah. pretty early on in my financial literacy journey. I don't know how many editions ago it was, probably three or four editions ago. But I actually have that book on my recommended list, uh, fairly high on my recommended list in a personal finance section. I think the book section on personal finance is even better than the investing information you include in it. Why do you think it's so important to take care of the basics and have a financial plan in place before worrying about investments? Well, first of all, most people, not your audience, your audience is doing very well uh, by and large, which is awesome and well-deserved. By the way, sorry for the digression, but my plan is medical school should be free and it should be paid for by doubling tuition at law school. <laughs> uh, too many lawyers, <laughs> and, and it's too hard for for docs. Um, it's a little late for your listeners, I guess, for this in case they adopt this plan. But anyway, um, the basics of personal finance, having an overall strategy, and getting into habits that uh, will allow you to come out at a few thousand dollars uh, uh, ahead each year, or a few hundred for you know just starting out. Uh, instead of a few thousand behind, which if you're a doc, you can easily, I mean, everybody wants to lend you money. So, I mean, it's easy to, to, uh, to, to build up all kinds of debt. But uh, unless it's done very well and with lots of 
a good strategy behind it. You don't want to be in debt at all. Um, uh, your mortgage, of course, is different. But so the basics, uh, and also from a marketing, from my point of view, most of the people in this country, again, not your audience, but they don't have any money. They're four hundred dollars away from a. You know, I mean, it's it's we have all kinds of problems. So if I can um, make it, my only real talent in this thing is to try to make it enough fun so people get motivated to actually try getting into better habits and, and see that if you can make a game out of it and if you have a goal, you're not sacrificing, um, you know, uh, a night out at the movies or, or sacrificing a Starbucks or whatever. You're actually, this is part of a, a goal where in three years, you're going to be out of debt. And in 10 years, you're going to have half a million dollars. And then all of a sudden, you're doing it because you want to, not because, oh, gosh, I can't afford to go to Starbucks or people are telling me not to. And I, you, basically, I try to help people own their financial futures and not to say that bad things can't happen. And I mean, you can't totally control it. But if you make a plan, um, at first, it's very hard, as with any kind of a new habit. But once you get going, uh, it becomes part of who you are and you wind up being the person, um, you know, um, who doesn't smoke and has uh, an extra million dollars at, at uh, when they're my age instead of having no money and lung cancer. Uh, I mean, that one habit of not, uh, of not smoking, if you can, I tell people, forget the whole thing about health. It's probably good for you, and and it makes you sexier, and all kinds of things. Think about the money. Think about the money. That's why you shouldn't smoke. And it's interesting. Uh, it's that's more of a motivator for some people. Um, and uh, anyhow, you know, I've been so, using that in my practice. I think oh. you mentioned that in your book. Oh uh, yes. at some point, and yeah. uh, and I have had that financial discussion with patients many times. Well, let's see. What are you paying for a pack? Eight bucks. How much do you smoke? Pack a day. Well, what's that work out to? Two hundred and forty bucks a month. Uh, you know, that's three grand a year. Yeah, that's a pretty nice vacation down to Mexico. Would you like to go to Mexico every year? Or would you like to keep smoking? And uh, and it's the first time they've ever added that up. You know, it's it's so powerful, and also it's tax free. So it's like getting a five thousand dollar raise, or better still, if you put it in a Roth IRA. And you start compounding it, uh, it makes uh, an amazing difference. Also, not to you know belabor the point, but your life insurance premiums uh, will be a lot lower if you're not a smoker, so you save you know a great deal of money of that, and you'll have fewer sick days and, and less uh, medical, you know, less uh, uh, what were Nyquil and all these other things that you you don't have to buy. Um, here I am prescribing to your. <laughs> um, you're going to be healthier. It, it saves a fortune. Um, anyway, uh, so that's the those kinds of things. Um, making a budget. Um, it sounds so boring, but and, and I would tell people, uh, for, yeah, we'll start by making a budget. And somebody finally said, "How do you do that?" And I'm thinking, "Duh!" And what do you mean? How do you do that? And then I realized, well, I guess so. I wound up writing. Um, it's in the it's in the chapter in the book, but I think I wrote it for Parade, which had I used to be have a cover of Parade magazine every you know one Sunday a year or something, and I think I did it for Parade for like twenty million people, um, and it was so fun because it's kind of like um, going through it. It's kind of like naming the states. Um, we can all you know you get you go through all the states, and you're up to forty six, and then you're. Up, Oh yeah, oh yeah, okay, Missouri, Missouri. And uh, no offense for anybody listening from Missouri. And 47. And then, you know, but boy, does it ever take a long time for you to come up with Delaware or whatever it is? It's very hard to get all 50. But um the chapter on making a budget and remembering, oh yeah, lawn care. I uh, lawn care. Or maybe I should just uh do something different with the lawn. Uh it's a it's a really useful exercise. Um and um Keeping track, once you get in the habits, then you don't even have to think about it. 
But to get into the habit, you've got to kind of organize yourself and make a plan and see the difference it can make and find ways that you can, instead of coming out $2,000 a year behind, come out $4,000 a year ahead. The difference over a lifetime is enormous because last I looked, the money the bank would pay you on your savings was like you know a couple percent. The money they would charge you on your credit card was like 20%. You know, so a lot of people um, who may even have some money in a savings account, they're earning 2% before tax with their right hand and paying 20%, which is not tax deductible on a credit card, with their left hand. They need to get organized. Yeah, for sure. Now, it, it, the updates in this book, the number of editions in it, it is significant. I mean, this book's been in now, what, uh, six different decades this book has existed. Take us on a journey through history over that time period. What are the changes you've had to make to this book over the years? What, what changed in the financial world that made you say, I got to do a new edition? Well, <laughs> um there are two kinds of things. One would be just world events uh, and where we are in the cycle. Each, um, it annoys some people because not everybody agrees with my perspective, but um, I usually kind of recap where we've been um, and what the next few years may uh, hold in store. Um, uh, The last edition, I said interest rates are really low. They're not going to go lower. At some point, they're going to start to go higher. And when they do, um, that's very tough on long-term bonds. It's a disaster for long-term bonds. And uh, higher interest rates are a challenge for stocks. Um, And for that matter, for real estate and for everything. So we've had, you know, we had this long period. First, we had, when I first wrote the book, um, we had, uh, it was just coming off inflation. Um, of enormous inflation. Treasury treasury bills were yielding 15%. Um, uh, last year, they were yielding, you know, a tenth of a percent, um, a huge difference. So we had this long period from uh, 1982, basically, down to about five minutes ago <laughs> when the wind was at our back. And Long-term interest rates were just unbelievably low. And just when you thought they couldn't get any lower, they kept getting lower. That's fantastic for the stock market. And it's fantastic for for business and for everything else. But in the last edition, I said, I don't know how long this, you know, this, it's not going to get any better. And at some point, it's going to get worse. And this edition, um, which, uh, you know, of course, I finished writing a, like two, three, four months ago. But... Um, this edition, it said, yeah, <laughs> I mean, and it looks like it really will get worse because um, with all um, with all the stimulus and with all the, uh, everything going on. Anyway, so so part of the things that I, um, and we could talk about all that because this is on a lot of people's minds, but so part of the differences are just to put it in a historical context and help people see where we are in these long cycles of um, uh, of interest rates and, and um, productivity and, and technology and, and all that. And part of it is just mechanical. Uh, before there were um, IRAs, you couldn't write about them. And before there were Roth IRAs, which are better than traditional IRAs for almost everybody, you couldn't write about them. Um, there were mutual funds, but then there were no load mutual funds. And then there were exchange traded funds, which are have an even lower expense ratio. Um, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, this edition, the um, I've added crypto. I've added venture investing, which is very fun. And uh, I've talked a little bit about meme stocks and Robinhood and all the stuff that you know uh, uh, people spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, and are you've got to be very careful to know what you're doing because most of this stuff is not a good idea for for people. But yeah, let's let's go through those three things that, that you changed in the most recent edition of the book or added to the book, rather. I shouldn't say changed. I mean, you included crypto assets in the book and you've been observing investments for a long time. As you mentioned, you're 150 years old. And, yes, exactly. uh, and I'm curious, <laughs> after watching markets for decades and decades, what's your take on crypto? 
So uh, crypto is, is not an investment. Uh, and most people would probably, be, you know, people who understand investing would agree. It, it's not productive. It doesn't pay dividends. It doesn't uh, um, pay interest. It's not an investment. It's basically a substitute um, for money. And, uh, but it's not a good substitute for money uh, for two reasons. I mean, ba- ba- well, for a bunch of reasons, but but money is two things. It's a medium of exchange, and it's also an accounting mechanism so you can make sensible decisions and, you know, corporations do their bookkeeping uh, in dollars in the U.S. and much of the world, not in Ethereum or Ripple or Bitcoin or, or whatever. Um, so uh, Bitcoin is so volatile, obviously, that... It's not like uh, a medium of exchange, and it's certainly not a way to do accounting. So as money, it's not great. Also, it's environmentally, you know, it takes so much energy to, to make it. Um, but one thing, I was just was watching David Pogue on um, CBS. He had a great little seven-minute segment on, on all this stuff, and he went through a lot of the caveats, but the, he, he missed the one that nobody ever thinks about, but at some point, it's going to be an issue. Every time you, I mean, I have tons of friends, I'm sure you do, and a lot of the people listening have made a fortune in Bitcoin, at least on paper, if they haven't cashed it in yet. So that's great and hooray for them. Um, But if you spend the Bitcoin, let's say you buy a Tesla with Bitcoin, but even if you buy just, you know, a coffee at some coffee shop that takes Bitcoin, technically, that's a taxable event. If you're buying the Tesla, or the cup of coffee with uh, Bitcoin selling at you know thirty thousand uh, dollars today or whenever whatever it's going to be when uh, uh, or uh, but you paid only fifteen hundred dollars for this thirty thousand Bitcoin you have a, it's almost an entirely a capital gain either long term or short term and yeah probably you won't be audited and certainly for the cup of coffee it's going to be very hard to figure out. But technically, you have to pay tax on all the Bitcoin that you spent. People, uh, I don't think, are taking that into account. Anyhow, um, it may just, it may never go down from wherever it is today. Um, But there's no particular reason for it to go up any faster than inflation. And it's not the best inflation edge. What it really is, is it's a hedge against collapse of the government. And the world order, or at least the order in the particular country you live in, most of us, the U.S. Um, and if you want to bet against the um, uh, the success of our uh, government and society, could be a good bet. I mean, to have, look, to have, especially if you bought it, I tried to buy some. When it got back from 30000 back down to 3000 I just figured, you know, I'll buy 10 of these things. And either I'll have something fun to write about when I lose it all, or maybe, and now it'd be worth a lot of money. I didn't wind up doing it for kind of a boring mechanical reason. But if I had it, I wouldn't probably sell it because to have a, uh, or at least not too much of it, because it's fun. You'll feel like an idiot if it goes to a million dollars of Bitcoin and you sold it, all that kind of stuff. But a much better hedge, hedge against inflation for the long term, stocks, real estate, uh, or private businesses, or your own education, you know, getting a, a, another degree to enhance your, your earning power. Uh, and I don't think that the, uh, ultimately the U.S. government is going to say, yeah, forget the dollar. Bitcoin is, is how we want to collect our taxes. So uh, anyway, that's crypto. I'm not a big fan, as you can tell. Sorry to go on at such length. Let's talk for a minute about ben- venture investing. What's your take on venture investing? Well, there I am a big fan, with an enormous caveat that uh, it's you have to assume you're going to lose your money. Uh, I mean, this is going to be uh, this has to be money you can afford to lose, which is true of the stock market or anything else. But uh, I had so much fun in the book. I'm not going to. I thought of maybe reading it. To you, but uh, I don't want to do that. But I, I have this long paragraph. I lost thirty thousand dollars in a thing that's this. I lost fifty thousand dollars in that. I lost, uh, you know. And I go through at, when I was putting it together. I realized, wow, I've lost even more than I thought in all these things. I've lost money in 
everything you can imagine. But every once in a while, uh, you know, you hit one that, that works. Uh, honest tea, if anybody drinks honest tea, um, we sold that to Coca-Cola and it worked out pretty well. And I had something that I didn't really know exactly what it was, but it, it was um, something having to do with logistics. So the trucks would come back with something in them instead of empty. Um, and um, it, the, I vaguely remember the name. Many, many years went by, like 12 years went by. And the thing is basically some, it was going well at first, but then something bad happened and I kind of lost track of it. Um, and I have an email account you may do the same thing, which isn't my real, my, my best email account. I have one for, you know, all the newsletters and all the spam and all the stuff. Uh, but I run my eye over every once in a while and um, delete, you know, deleting hundreds at a time. And I see uh, a sender from Haystack. I'm thinking, hmm, that sounds familiar. What is that? And I have, maybe I better. So I clicked it and it said, um, uh, oh, and it had an attachment. So I was thinking, uh oh, I hope this isn't, they're not trying to put a virus in my computer and all that stuff. But so I won't open the attachment, but I'll look at the email. Said, it said, um, this isn't the email we sent you last week. This is something else you have to sign. Uh, and I, realized, I said, oh, okay, they finally going bankrupt and they want me to sign, you know, waivers or whatever happens when they go bankrupt and you're a shareholder. But I looked and sure enough, the previous week they had sent me something with another attachment. And that one, that email said, um, we've just sold the company for $252 million. Uh, <laughs> please, I'd like to tell you I own 10% of the company. Not quite. Uh, but I own enough so that it made up for an awful lot of mistakes. Um, so every, and the thing that I love about venture investing, other than it's fun and interesting, is uh, depending on the venture, of course, but the ones I tend to invest in, uh, if they work, will make the world better. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with my investment in wheel tug, but if we get FAA approval and it works finally and all this, everybody listening, when you take a flight on a 737 or an A320, at some point, not any, not in the next few months, but in the next few years, you won't have to wait for a tug to pull you back out from the gate and the plane will be able to, to um, twist when it gets to the gate and park, park parallel instead of nose in, so you can board and, and deplane from the front and the back door, which cuts 15 minutes. I mean, it's going to make every airline and every airport uh, 10 or 15% more efficient because the time you spend on the ground is wasted. And it's going to make every passenger, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I have a whole bunch like that. And some of them are going to fail. And some of them, but if one or two succeed, um, you know, I'll be able to go the next 150 years without having to work. So what, uh, what, what's a reasonable percentage of your portfolio to have in something like venture investing? Well, for most people, zero. Uh, it depends, but it depends on, on where, you know, your overall circumstances. Um, there are a couple of, I mean, one way to do it, of course, is to go into funds that do this. And I, uh, most of them, I, ha I have a lot of caveats in the book about why the, the expenses wind up being so much, and it's not necessarily the best way. But there are uh, some where rather than you pick the venture yourself, um, uh, you can diversify because you might be in 10 or 20 or 30 with professionals who, you know, spend a lot of time trying to figure out which ones are going to work. Um, that one, of the, one of the funds that you can go into actually has a way to get people like us who normally wouldn't be able to get into the really hot Silicon Valley stuff that uh, Kleiner Perkins and all these, you know, big deal people do. They've kind of figured out a way to, to uh, get the little guy into those things. So, um, you know, in my case, it's probably half my net worth, um, but I'm not typical. I'm very lucky. I don't, and I, everybody's different. Um, but to have, but this sort of segues into a, a, another thought that I, uh, if I can offer it, which is, you know, most people, you're a doctor, you're a surgeon, you're a dentist, you're doing incredibly important work. It's wonderful. Your, your goal isn't, you know, to become the richest man in the world or be able to go into space on your own spaceship or anything. Um, you have this great life. So most of your money 
should be, uh, you know, over time, um, at least the money that you want in the stock market, which is most of it, um, for your long-term money, most of it should be in index funds. And you will do better than 90% of your friends and neighbors and and your and even those are your friends who went to business school instead of to um, medical school. Uh, index funds have the lightest possible jockey. Think of mutual funds as, as horses in a horse race. Um, uh, an index fund will have like a 20 pound jockey. Uh, an actively traded fund will have a hundred or a 200 pound jockey, especially when you figure in the, some of the tax consequences, it could be a three or 400 pound jockey. So, um, over the long run, most of the money should be on a regular basis of dollar cost averaging should be an index fund. But if you're a human, uh, and I think virtually all of your, you know, the audience are, um, it's so boring, right? So I think to, to carve out 10 or 20 percent, not more than 20 and, and kind of meaningless to be less than 10, but for speculative things uh, in the stock market, uh, not where you're trying to find crazy risks and you don't have to do it all at once, but um, if you find some new medical device or something that you think is going to be great and it's and it's hasn't been approved yet, but you know about it because this is part of your field and you think this company could be really good, to put a little money into that and to, you know, your son or your cousin or something is has some money, to put five or six chips down in risky things, the ones you lose on, which of course could be all five or six, but the, the ones you lose on up to $3,000 a year lowers your taxable income. Um, and, um, uh, and that saves you a little bit on taxes. The ones you win on, and every so often you might have one where you do make 10 or 20 times your money, uh, as long as you've held it for more than a year and a day, first of all, that's a nice big win. But if you do any charitable giving, it shouldn't be with money. Uh, and it shouldn't even be with stock, although that's a great way to do it. It should be through a thing called the uh, either the Fidelity Charitable Gift Fund or the Vanguard Charitable Gift Fund or the Schwab Gift Fund. Um, I don't want to go through all the details, but but it makes it so much more convenient and so much more tax effective. So you have the fun of of you know the most of your money is sensibly invested, but you have some fun, and you have the tax control to um, come out ahead, even if you break even. And I hope you do better than break even. But if you just break even after tax, you come out ahead. So that's one little piece of this. Well, speaking of, uh, you know, index funds and maybe the opposite of index funds, you include a section about meme stocks in your newest edition. And I understand you kind of have a your connection here. You've got a, a cousin that's the CEO of AMC. Oh, so, Give us your take on meme stocks. Um, well, meme stocks are... <laughs> meme stocks are the, are the notion that we're going to find... Some, what, what really happened is... as a lot of people know there was a company called GameStop that was in big trouble. And there were some others, but GameStop was the first one. And um, a lot of very sophisticated professional uh, investors shorted the stock, knowing it was going to go down because it had to go bankrupt. And, and somehow uh, on Reddit and one place or another, little guys uh, were angry about this and, and rightly, um, you know, I mean, the, Stuff being a little guy when there are so many people with 400 foot yachts and there and, and and all this stuff, and they said, "Heck no, we're gonna buy this." Not you know, it was three dollars a share, four dollars, whatever it was. I'm gonna buy 50 shares, 200 bucks, but I can you know. And millions of people bought the shares. The people who were short either had to or got scared and, and started buying to cover their shorts. And the stock at one point it went. Uh, I think it hit 480, up from four or two or whatever it was. Um, and this was the triumph of the of the little guy, not because GameStop is suddenly people realize oh it's going to make so much profits and pay out so much dividends or anything any business reason. It's just the crowd um, uh, like tulips. As long as it's going up, it's going up. As long as someone will pay more, um, musical chairs. 
So um, my baby cousin, who is not 150, but um, he's actually the CEO of, uh, of AMC, and I love the movies, and I love my cousin, uh, and I love popcorn. Um, but they were in pretty rough shape because with COVID, nobody was going to the movies. Um, and the movie business wasn't spectacular even before because with Netflix and everything else and streaming. Um, and the stock went from like a couple bucks up to, I think, 78 or something, which is, you know, make 35 times your money in a, in a few months. That's pretty appealing. Anyway, I, I'm not going to, I could tell you lots more about <laughs> that, but suffice to say, I have a wonderful cousin. Um, I don't think it was a good buy at $78. I didn't buy it at $78. And meme stocks, uh, you know, this is, if you want to play musical chairs or you want to go to Las Vegas, obviously, you know, some people go to Las Vegas and they hit the jackpot, but it's not because they were so smart in Las Vegas, um, unless they're counting cards, in which case they're going to get their knees broken. Um, <laughs> you know, um, and uh, yeah, the slow but steady wins the race. And my job in the in the book is basically to try to make it fun or, or, or give people enough of the uh, uh, enough confidence so they don't spend so much money on professional advice that's not going to be it's going to be well intended. But professional if, if professionals if if, if spending two thousand dollars a year on professional advice is going to have you do really well, well, and six thousand will make you do three times. It, it doesn't work that way. The professionals do average. Uh, they have good years. They have bad years, depending, you know, uh, but by and large, with rare exceptions like Warren Buffett and, and Peter Lynch and, and uh, all that, you can't have everybody doing above average. Um, so the, the, the trick is to keep your expenses really low, uh, which is why you want a 20 pound jockey, not a 200 pound jockey and so on. So our audience is is composed of high-income professionals, mostly doctors. What financial mistakes do you see those folks making specifically, and do you have any specific advice for them? Well, uh, you know, I do know that doctors and dentists and, uh, and, and so on uh, are real targets. I mean, every life insurance agent in the world wants to sell whole life or variable life or universal life, one of these life insurance products that are possible to understand uh, and compare, which is one of the reasons that they're so profitable for the insurance companies. Um, and so uh, your audience are, are targets for all, ki uh, all kinds of sales pitches. Um, you may need life insurance, but you probably want inexpensive term life insurance that doesn't require a salesman. Uh, there are some people look for, a, 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 for a, somebody with a very large medical practice, you have an accountant, talk to your accountant, don't listen to me about some of this stuff because um, there are situations where you might want a different, a different setup because of taxes and one thing or another. But by and large, um, you don't want that. You don't want to be sold annuities by an annuity salesman who under, uh, you know, who gets a huge commission. And um, you can, part of the, one of the things the book does is just goes through all these things that you don't want to do. Uh, to kind of arm you for the conversation when your college classmate, uh, who may be a terrific woman or a lovely guy, um, and they would like to see you do well, but they make a big commission and they persuaded themselves that this is, you know, uh, this is something you should buy. So the most important thing, I guess, is that, yeah, you, you may well have your accountant and you may have people you trust. But don't spend a lot of money uh, on the expenses, on the frictional cost of this stuff, because that does not add to your return. Um, it used to be that people assumed you could get 10% a year in the stock market, uh, at least. How could you not? So to pay 1%, eh, okay. But 1% is 10% of 10%. So 10% is not nothing. And if we have a period where you only get 3 or 4% in the stock market, um, one percent of three or four percent is a lot of it. And you say, how could we ever have a period like that? Well, I remember 1966 when uh, again, did I mention that I'm 150 years old? In 1960s, <laughs> I'm actually 75, so I'm half. This is half true. <laughs> Everything I say, by the way, half true. Um, <laughs> so, so 
1966, I remember the day um, the Dow Jones Industrial Average broke through 1,000 for the first time in history. Uh, it didn't close above 1,000, but it in, intraday broke through 1,000. It took 16 years till 1980, uh, uh, 1982, I think I had that right, um, but 16 years to get back to 1,000. 16 years is a long time to wait. Not for me, by now, I mean, it goes very fast. But if you're, if somebody's listening is in their 30s or 40s, to wait 16 years to break even on, on your stock in GameStop or, or whatever, it's a long time. So uh, it's really important to keep expenses low because you can't assume that your, uh, especially your after tax return and your after inflation return, I mean, it's tough to make 3% after tax, after inflation on your money. Um, and the easiest way to, the easiest way to improve your return is not to give up expenses that you don't have to give up. Well, I inflation is now over 8%. Now you were a, a columnist, you were an author. The last time we had significant inflation back in the seventies, what do you, right. what advice do you have for our listeners regarding inflation now? Uh, I like to think this is going to be different um, because um, aspects of it are very much tied to the aftermath of COVID, all that pent up demand and, 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 um, and the, obviously the Ukraine and, and, and oil and oil prices or energy prices go into everything. Um, so it may well be that um, over the next year or two, we get this more or less under control. Things come back to more or less normal. Uh, we could have a recession in the meantime. I don't know. We, and, and interest rates, uh, I think we're done with crazy low interest rates, but you never know. Um, but it's also possible that we're going to have, um, it's going to be tougher than that, and it'll be inflation of the type that we had um, in the 70s. Eventually, we will uh, fix it because um, we have to. Uh, and everybody, the Fed knows we have to, the Congress knows we have to, the voters know we have to. So we'll fix it. It may be painful, but the, so one thing to know is it's not going to be forever. I think, you know, uh, I don't think the the dollar is going to become worthless the way the Russian ruble did in 1917, or the way the German mark did in in, um, in the Weimar Republic in the in the 30s, where you needed a wheelbarrow of, of, of cash. So no, number one, I think uh, we may get off uh, easy, or at least it's certainly going to end. It's not, I don't think it's going to be like it was. Um, in the 70s. I could be wrong. But the other thing, even more important thing, is whatever happens, there is going to be, people are going to need places to live um, and places to work and the things that they buy. And if you own part of the company that sells the now $100 movie ticket uh, or the, the $200 basketball or the uh, $41 pound of you know, whatever it is, if, if you own the business and the business is well run, doesn't have too much debt and can survive this inflation itself and, and any recession we have, the business you will own. Um, uh, I mean, I, I'm not saying it as simply as I should. Think of it this way. You own a house. Um, oh, it's doubled in value. Well, it's still a four bedroom house. It hasn't doubled in bedrooms or in bathrooms or in swimming pools. Uh, you still own a house. It's kept up with inflation. Um, uh, if you own stock in a company, depends on the company and how it's uh, run, but basically over the long run, no matter what happens with inflation, your shares in that company could well um, not only uh, keep up with inflation, but because the company is productive and maybe growing and becoming more uh, more productive with better technology, uh, you can do great with the with the company. So the place you certainly don't want a lot of money sitting in the bank. Uh, well, the, most importantly, you don't want any of it in long term bonds because you're going to get killed um, in inflation. Anyway, I'm taking. I, you know, I tend to run on at some length. The advantage of the book is I can go over and over and kind of with a scalpel, and I can try <laughs> to say things. I, I really I write so much better than I talk because I can. <laughs> Slim it down and slim it down. 
You know, it, it's interesting. I thought I had a deal with the Fed, right? I thought the deal was if inflation starts going up, they're going to raise interest rates. And I don't right. feel like they kept up their end of the deal. You know, they kept them low for so long that now even these six little raises they're planning this year, it feels like too little too late. I mean, uh, 10-year treasury yields are 2.8%. My high yield savings accounts paying 0.5 and inflation's at eight. What do you think about the path the Fed steered us down the last couple of years? Are they behind the able? Well, we have, uh, you know, big challenges ahead, that's for sure. I don't know that the Fed um, did it wrong. I, I do think the, the the stimulus may have been, uh, you know, there were reasons for it. But to send money um, to people who didn't lose their jobs and send them $1,400 uh, or, or um, didn't seem to me as targeted as to send it to the people who actually needed it. You know, there, there are things that in hindsight, especially if, if you could, if there weren't the mechanics that can be very difficult, it's just, it's one thing to have the idea. It's another thing to do it in a way that doesn't involve fraud and months and months of adjudication and all that. Um, there are things that probably could have been done um, better, but, you know, we didn't have, Huge inflation until I mean people weren't thinking about inflation until quite recently and and uh, but we did have the prospect the possibility of a global depression and collapse and those are very hard to come back from <laughs> you, you don't flip, flip the switch on that so if the Fed and if the stimulus uh, by saving the world from global depression which also can lead to more wars and to civil war and to horrible things I mean you know the thing the bad things that haven't happened we Take for granted, of course. I mean, we didn't have, but they could have happened, and we kept them from happening. And I think that um, we should feel pretty good that we kept them from happening. And now we have some inflation to deal with, and and in the next couple of years, hopefully, we'll get it under control. Ideally, without a recession, but um, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, but no, I think the Fed. I got to to uh, interview Paul Volcker when he was chairman of the Fed. And uh, in that period when uh, inflation was 15% and treasury uh, bills were yielding 15% and mortgages were you know, as much as like 18, but crazy times. And uh, it was the most interesting few hours I ever spent. I was like 12 years old and he was this incredible person with a 20-inch cigar and, and his feet <laughs> up on the... Uh, I mean, it, it was awesome. So, um, And he, he basically said... I, I mean, what I took away from it um, was that, yeah, of course, he's a superb economist and he's a brilliant guy and uh, it's a real, he was a real hero to the country, I think. He's the one who put the screws on the whole thing and gave us this terrible recession but killed inflation. Um, but I, it turns out that the job of being the chairman of the Fed, even though you've got to be a great economist and all that, you're really the national psychologist. You've got to figure out what you've got to try to get in people's, the collective head of, of uh, the American people, um, or what are they expecting and how do you get them not to expect inflation? Because if people expect inflation, then we're going to have inflation. Uh, I mean, if, if it gets... Uh, if it gets to be a, uh, a syndrome where no one can imagine that it's going to be tamed. Right now, people can absolutely imagine, and they should imagine, that it will be tamed because it will be. Um, but anyhow, um, uh, Volcker was a hero, and we had a very rough recession that was necessary. This time, we absolutely may not need uh, a terrible recession, and we may not even need a recession at all. Um, uh, you know, oil prices can come down uh, very quickly. Uh, it was six months ago, uh, people who owned oil stocks were, I, I may, don't hold me to the six number, but some months ago, uh, not more than a year ago, people were uh, who owned oil stocks were moaning that the price was so low, and now no one thinks it can ever get low again. It, it's it's going to come back down, um, in part because uh, renewables are getting so much more competitive. Uh, it's cheaper now, uh, renewables, than, than coal and, and fossil fuels in many situations. And that's just accelerating. Um, and there are tons of reasons to be optimistic. Um, and uh, so 
maybe that's where we should end on a bright note. But uh, yeah, you know, I mean, investors have to be optimistic. You know, that's kind of the nature of being an investor. And usually, despite the fact that being a pessimist sounds smarter, the optimists have won historically, you know. Yes, very good point. Let's get even more political for a minute. Uh, although, not for a long tangent, but just a brief one. Although you count many Republicans among your friends, you served as the treasurer of the Democratic National Committee for many years. Now, many people view today's political polarization as a huge problem. I'm curious if you do. And if so, what do you think should be done about it? It is a terrible problem uh, with polarization. Um, and it's playing right into Putin's hands. I mean, he, I think he had something to do with Brexit. Uh, and I think that he wants us to be as polarized as possible. Uh, because if we're polarized, we don't get anything done. And it could lead to all kinds of terrible stuff. It's not only Putin, of course. But there's a lot of money to be made in the extremes. Uh, you raise a lot more money, whether you're a media outlet or a political fundraiser, if you scream and shout horrible things that are might have a grain of truth, but are so overdone on either side. Um, and uh, it's a terrible problem. Um, I'm a liberal, but basically a moderate Democrat. Um, and I, you know, Eisenhower and Nixon, except for, of course, he had his issues, but uh, uh, Eisenhower and Nixon and Reagan, I, I was actually, so I was on a long time ago, I was on a radio talk show for one of the previous editions of this thing. And the, the publicist warned me in advance, now this guy, and this before there even were really right wing, I didn't know what, it, this was way back, I think before the Tea Party, before a long time ago. And um, the publicist said, I just want to tell you this, this fellow, he's a lot of fun. You'll like him, but he's very right wing. Um, and you should just know that. So, um, and uh, <laughs> so we get to the call-in section of the, of the show and somebody asked me about something or other. And I realized, oh, what a softball. I'm going to convert every right wing listener to, and I said, listen, Pete Peterson, even Pete Peterson, who was Nixon's commerce secretary, even he says, da, 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 da. and the host of the thing starts to laugh, and I get a little nervous. Um, and I said, why are you laughing? He said, listen, you know, you're a nice guy, but you don't get it. To us, Nixon was a socialist, um, you know, and, and, uh, and Reagan, of course, by now this... Uh, Reagan could never be. Uh, this isn't the Republican Party. So, if we, if it were the Republican Party that we most of us knew until about twenty years ago, okay, you might disagree, but you disagree agreeably and you compromise and all that. Um, compromise is really important if we're going to get anywhere. So, yeah, it's a terrible problem, and the solutions are um, fixing the gerrymandering, and there are uh, ways to do that. And um, mail-in uh, pr for primaries, especially mail-in ballots for primaries, and, uh, so that you don't have to be a real uh, super duper activist uh, to take the time to go to the primary. Uh, we should get rid of the caucuses. Um, it should all be primaries. It should be easy to vote in the primaries, so more people do it, not just the extremes. So uh, average people do it, and uh, there should be rank. <clears throat> ranked choice voting, um, also called instant runoff voting, which means you vote for Ralph Nader as your first choice because, oh my God, he's fantastic. Or you vote for Marjorie Taylor Greene because, oh my God, she, and, you know, QAnon, this is, this is the real truth. Okay. But if need be, as your second choice is, you know, you would vote for Gore instead of Bush, let's say, or you would vote for, uh, uh, you know, whoever on the other side, uh, instead of Marjorie Taylor Greene. And that gives moderates, or gives all the politicians some reason to, to try to appeal to people in the middle, people who are not rabid left-wing or rabid right-wing. So those, those structural changes, which are possible and, and we're making some progress in some of them, that would um, help to um, deal with the polarization, and we need to. Another area of your life that I think people would find really interesting is you have been on a bit of a personal crusade against smoking. 
Can you tell us about some of the things you did to fight smoking? Well, <clears throat> I'm just a bit player in this, but I did um, a couple things. Um, every uh, every summer, uh, airplanes would go up and down the beach, um, you know, with these banners, um, Newport, the, um, the perfect recess. Uh, now, they're not trying to appeal to kids. Tobacco companies do not want kids to smoke. So recess is not, you know, which used to be what you had in between uh, classes in elementary school. They're not, that just happens to be a coincidence. But anyway, Newport, the perfect recess, and there were a couple others. I forget now. I uh, have to look. But after a couple summers, I, I called up and I found it's not that expensive to get one of these planes. So I hired a plane to follow the other plane, and mine said Newport, the permanent recess. And I had another one, Larry Tish sells caster sticks, uh, and I had all these planes following their planes. Uh, the following summer, they stopped. So that was one. <laughs> and the other, I went to Russia uh, back when everything was changing, and uh, I had read in the Wall Street Journal that you could buy a minute of time on the or 30 seconds on the on the nightly news uh for three thousand dollars and i figured wow i got three thousand dollars i even have thirty thousand dollars i'll buy 10 30 second spots by the time i got over there for various reasons turned out it wasn't 30 seconds it was a minute uh and it wasn't three thousand it was twelve hundred and there were only three networks back then so i took um 50, for 15 nights, night after night, on uh, all three networks in December when it was way too dark and cold to go outside during the nightly news. And you couldn't mute the TV uh, and go into the other room for beer because they didn't have remote controls. Uh, this was like 1992 and things were pretty primitive back, back then. So I annoyed the entire former Soviet Union with my dreadful high school Russian um, saying in the, the, the tagline of each of the eight, they were each one was different, but the, the tagline of each one was kids, don't become slaves to the tobacco companies like your parents. And my reasoning was uh, kids don't, you can't tell kids not what not to do because that's not going to that work. But if you tell them that their parents are kind of dumb, that they, they might react to. So anyway, um, and I know it annoyed the whole former Soviet Union because uh, about six months later, somebody sent me a tape. They had made a spoof. Somebody um, on a big <laughs> popular uh, comedy show, they had spoofed my terrible American accent and, uh, and, and all that. So, yeah, kids, don't smoke. And doctors um, know this better than anybody. And you have shown how you can um, turn it into a financial thing and, and, and get people to stop smoking that way. Well, our time's getting short, but tell us what you're working on now. Here's the part where you should hold up the book for those watching on YouTube. Oh, show them, show no them the book cover. No one is watching. And they're listening. We've been going for three hours. <laughs> I'm now 152 years old. Here's the book. Um, and, um, uh, the, so, whatever. Um, uh, the only investment guide you'll ever need. And what am I working on now? I have a little daily uh, blog post most days. Um, um, they started out, I, I've done about 6,500 of them. So if you've missed any of them, they're all archived. And if you have like two or three months, you could, you know, like two minutes <laughs> uh, at andrewtobias.com. And it's sometimes, sometimes I offer um, irresponsible stock recommendations for money that you tr can truly afford to lose. I always <laughs> stress that. And as my readers can tell you, we truly have lost on, on many of them, but others have worked out quite well. Um, but much of it by now is kind of politics and what's going on in Ukraine. And because and, um, uh, this is, you know, after 200,000 years, um, when nothing pretty much happened until maybe 10, uh, somebody they invented fire and somebody thought of the wheel. These were big things and language was good. But basically nothing happened until, uh, what, uh, 10,000 years ago and some cave paintings and some more things. But, and then the Romans learned how to do indoor plumbing, but they forgot. So that didn't really count. Gutenberg is 500 years ago with printing press. That was pretty big. And since then, it has just speeded up until, what, 150 years ago, information could never travel more than seven miles an hour as fast as a horse could run or whatever. 
we these are the next 10 or 20 years will set the trajectory we are either on the cusp of unparalleled prosperity as a species uh, cancer in a few years you go and they'll just take a pill or they'll do a little wand thing the cancer's gone um the uh the vaccines we're able to do now which by the way were a darpa hooray for moderna and for pfizer but it's darpa that did the underlying which is you know uh, the big bad government uh, got this thing going um we're either on the cusp of unbelievable prosperity where almost everybody can have a decent, comfortable life and all that. Or more likely, probably, uh, we're about to hurtle off the rails as a species. The cockroaches will be here, um, uh, but we won't. I mean, there's so many ways this could go wrong. So this is a time to pay attention and to figure out how do you want to live your life and, and how much of the world's resource? I mean, can you have a, a good time living light on the land? Um, if you can, if the only way to be happy is to have, you know, something that consumes a huge amount of, of uh, fossil fuel and, and so on and so forth. Well, okay. But if you could find another way, it might be better and might save you a lot of money and set you up for a better retirement. All right, last question. Our time is now short, but you've got the ear of 30 or 40,000 high income professionals, mostly doctors. What have we not yet talked about today that you think they should know? Huh. All right. So, um, I guess one of the things that I like to say, and, they, and many of your listeners do know this, but um, I think that happiness, which is after all what we're kind of all after, as it's the uh, happiness is a matter of direction, not amount. So especially for your younger listeners, um, I think if you had uh, two families, one earning uh, $50,000 a year, but somehow knowing that it's headed up to 150000 and another earning $500,000 a year, but somehow knowing it's headed down to two fifty, the first Families never going to even cat that. They'll maybe they'll get to 150, and the second one will never get lower than 250. I think the first family earning 50 is a happier family or a happier individual or doc than the second because things are looking up, things are going the right direction, things can get better every year. Um, so what I counsel everybody, um, and uh, I apologize because you have a very sophisticated audience, so this may be too simple minded, but Pace yourself. Pace yourself. A, a luxury once sampled becomes a necessity. Um, and so, you know, maybe you can afford, especially if you take a loan, um, and you can certainly get a loan, as we uh, were talking about before. You can afford to go first class. But once you get used to first class, it's so depressing to have to go to Greece or to the Bahamas or someplace in coach. Oh, my God. You know. Um, and, uh, anyhow, uh, it's a direction, not amount. So these philosophical kinds of things, uh, may be as important in the long run as figuring out which index fund to buy or, or whether or not to go into crypto. Awesome. Well, Andy, thank you so much for being on the White Coat Investor podcast today. For the listeners out there, check out his book. If you have not yet read, the, read this one, this is one of my favorite books on both personal finance and investing. The only investment guide you'll ever need. You can pick it up at Amazon or wherever you like buying books. And, uh, and thanks so much for being on the podcast and sharing your wisdom. Thank you. It's a lot of fun. Hope you enjoyed that interview as much as I did. It's uh, always good fun to get somebody that you've... Uh, read their work and follow them a little bit and, and actually get to know them a little bit personally. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, you can check out his book. There'll be a link in the show notes that you can check out. Uh, while you're there, check out our link to our new asset protection book. Okay. The white coat investors uh, guide to asset protection. It's my newest book. It may not be as entertaining as Andy's book. Um, but it is a uh, comprehensive book on the subject that if you are interested in anything about asset protection for physicians, this is the book to check out. So there'll be a link in the show notes for that as well, or you can just look it up on Amazon. Have you ever considered a different way of practicing medicine? Whether you're burned out, need a change of pace, or looking to supplement your income, Locum Tenens might be the solution for you. Not sure where to start? LocumStory.com is a place where you can get real, 
unbiased answers to your questions. They answer basic questions like what is locum tenens to more complex questions about pay ranges, taxes, various specialties. Now locum tenens can work for you. Go to locumstory.com and get the answers. Thanks for leaving us five-star reviews. Most recent one came in saying, great show. I really enjoy your show. After listening to a few episodes, I was totally hooked. It has great direction. It deals with very instructive and interesting topics. I really love this program. Thank you, Mary Ann. For the rest of you, keep your head up, shoulders back. You've got this and we can help. We'll see you next time on the White Coat Investor Podcast. The hosts of the White Coat Investor Podcast are not licensed accountants, attorneys, or financial advisors. This podcast is free entertainment and information only. It should not be considered professional or personalized financial advice. You should consult the appropriate professional for specific advice relating to your situation.